Welcome to this week's ANN in depth. Today we're going to be talking about pastors and depression, which is not the most exciting topic, but a very, very important one. And I am joined by two amazing people here. We have uh, Dr. Um, uh, D. Knight. She is a counselor. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, and we also have uh, Paul Anderson, who is the director of chaplaincy for the North American Division. Thank you both for joining us in this very important topic. Uh, well, I'm going to open up with a question. As a pastor myself, I was in a local church for 11 years before serving where I am now. And at some point, pastors realize that sheep have teeth and sometimes they use it. Uh, other times there are situations, the, the, the pressure of, of running multiple churches perhaps or uh, being part of people's lives in their best and worst moments. You're there for their weddings. You're there for when their children are born, but you're also there holding their hands as their last breath slips away. You need to be a chaplain in some senses. You need to be a, a semi-counselor in others. And it's easy to create this distinction between the two. But people tell their lives to pastors and you go home and you feel a sense of responsibility for helping them, whether you have the tools and the knowledge or not. And today we're going to be talking about pastors who are feeling depressed. Many of them will listen to this broadcast. Um, and how can we help them? What should they do next? How do you understand this situation? Now, Paul, I want to start with you. You have lots of encounters with many pastors. What are your thoughts about this issue? Well, um, I think this is a providential moment and um, uh, invitation. I say that because um, I got the call to participate in this yesterday, and I was wondering um, as I pondered it, why did they call me? Well, it must be because um, somehow I typify everything that this discussion is going to be about. We're talking about uh, pastors who become depressed, and a lot of us will never admit to ourselves, our spouses, our children, or even the world around us that we are depressed. Because somehow, um, acceding to that moniker erases our Superman S off of our chest. And so I'd like to start by simply confessing the fact that um, I have been wrestling with uh, what I've come to realize is now labeled high functioning depression for several years. And I didn't know exactly what it was when it hit, but it's like hitting a wall and it forces you to confront who you are, who you have been, who you are not and who you may never become. But it also introduces us pastors who sometimes see ourselves or are seen as superhuman to our humanity. Thank you. That's that's incredibly insightful. And thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Dr. D, do you see pastors in your in your practice or or and what are your thoughts if whether you do or not and about the situation? Yes, absolutely. Actually, um, I just kind of closed my practice to only see um, adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. But prior to that, I was seeing only uh, clergy members, other therapists, and adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse for therapy. Um, I just kind of made room in my schedule uh, for that, uh, simply because it is something that a lot of pastors experience. And once somebody is willing to get the help, I absolutely want them to be able to have that help available to them and he is absolutely right. There's a stigma against it. In fact, yesterday I was um, speaking on a panel and one person said, uh, you know, ask for counseling services so that you can lose your job. And it's just like, oh no, I hate that people think that their job might be in jeopardy because they might need counseling services. So there's absolutely a stigma and that ought not be. Yeah. I, I think the stigma is, th there is, I've been thinking about this for a very long time. If you are an, uh, responsible for an operation, it doesn't really matter if you're a pastor or not at this point. If you're responsible for leading a number of people and any operation depends on you, um, there is a side of people 
questioning your competence if you mention that you are struggling with with depression and this is a i'm not sure how to solve this you know if you have the president of a conference say or even a local church pastor in the local church you know come out and say look i'm struggling with with depression and i don't know how i'm going to continue in this in this way i've seek for help and and I'm I'm going through that process now of of help, you know, Paul. You mentioned a, a form of depression, high functioning depression. I'm I'm not sure exactly what that is. Maybe you can expand that to us. Um, but the question immediately comes: Are they capable of continuing doing their job? The next time that you chair a board, people are questioning whether you know the way that you're chairing or the ideas that you're bringing are a reflection of this difficult moment where you're going through right now. And it's not like breaking a leg. You know, you break a leg, you go to the doctor, they help you. And yes, if you were trying to run a marathon with your leg broken, people will question that. But with mental health, it affects everything that you do. And so the question comes, are they still competent enough to do the work that they're doing? Um, Paul, how would you how would you respond to that? Is that is that what happens? Um, it, it depends on, on the circumstance and the environment in which you work. There is a stigma, but the stigma is being eroded by the realities of, of ministry, gospel ministry. And in the past couple of years, it's become even more uh, apropos discussion because some of the evangelical pastors uh, who, who committed suicide, because they felt that there was no exit and and no elimination of the pain that they were feeling and sometimes you know no one can really comprehend another person's pain and something that is pain inducing especially emotionally or psychically to one person may not negatively affect another person so it's an invisible illness. You mentioned a broken leg or someone who's been injured visibly and is bleeding. That's something that people can comprehend or, or um, perceive. But an invisible injury, uh, and a lot of pastors, like soldiers who have deployed to combat, are experiencing um, either secondary or tertiary trauma um, they because pastors come in in times of crisis um, and they often experience moral injury um, because of what happens in their local congregation or in their relationships with administration we, we should be able to figure this out more clearly because you know the same peanut butter that one person enjoys could cause a reaction in someone else who has allergies and kill them. We are not the same, you know, we're different and we will react differently to situations. Um, yeah, Dr. D, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, the, yes, pastors have to deal with a lot. And I think uh, that was the first thing that was noted, but also, uh, I mean, they have to deal with a lot just from their members, but also for their own lives. Life has not somehow skipped over you because you've been called to pastor, right? Just because you've been called to minister. Life has probably set itself right down on your doorstep and darkened it a time or two, right? So just um, uh, having to deal with others' trauma and uh, I think vicarious trauma was mentioned, having to deal with other people's trauma, having to deal with your own trauma. Um, all of those things are super important for just healthy living to be able to deal with it in a healthy way. In fact, um, one of my uh, uh, favorite neuroscientists says that the number one indicator for the success of your children, and therefore I would say the success of your own life, is how you make sense of your life. And how do you take the time to do that? Our pastors have to be able to take the time to do that. They have to be able to recognize and acknowledge, hey, some Something's not right here and I need to make sense of this situation without feeling like um, they're being stigmatized or they're being uh, somehow uh, looked at differently because they might make the wrong decisions. The reality is life is happening to all of us and it is actually a healthy decision to take care of your mental health. So I just think to myself, you know, just like uh, we have these uh, uh, pastoral uh, conferences and whatnot for replenishing and refreshing. What if we made it standard that those also included, uh, you know, something about mental health, not just something about mental health, but that we required or we expected, I wouldn't say
say required because I'm a little I'm a little iffy on requiring uh, mental health counseling. But what if we expected our pastors, because of the heavy burdens they bear, to actually get mental health counseling? Mm. Well, you mentioned a good point, and um, if I could, uh, an uninvited um, plug for the Pastoral Evangelism and Leadership Conference this year that's going to be virtual, and um, its topics are going to be clergy and emotional and spiritual health. And oh. curiously, I'm, I have a presentation as part of the PELC. Uh, virtual experience on depression and suicide among spiritual leaders. So I think we're at a place now where we're actually beginning to say, physician, heal thyself. Clergy, yeah. tend to that hole in your own soul. Yeah. But isn't, isn't prayer and believing in Jesus enough? No. Yeah, I'll say no as well. <laughs> so anytime anyone asks, is prayer enough? Um, I always just, I think to myself, uh, for whatever reason, uh, that we are told we have one who ever lives to intercede for us. And yet that same one went to a cross, right? So if prayer were enough, Jesus would have stayed in heaven. Um, and so uh, prayer is never enough <laughs> for any of these situations where we are given earthly tools to be able to help us, right? And so I always think of uh, Lazarus and how Jesus, uh, Jesus called him forth from the tomb. Wonderful. I love the uh, concept and the reminder that there are some things, some dead places in our lives that Jesus has to see about, that Jesus has to fix, right? But when he called him forth, he commanded everyone around him to remove his grave clothes. Hmm. Jesus could have called him out of the grave clothes, but he didn't. He commissioned people around to hmm. actually help unbind him. And so I always think of that with counseling because there are people who are commissioned to help unbind people and we ought to let that be. I hope, Dr. D, that you preach frequently. And I, I would <laughs> love to have the links to those because I, I, I would be greatly blessed. Um, <laughs> Glory to God. Let me tell you guys a story. Uh, and I... I fear telling my own stories, but it's the one that I know most intimately. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, I think I had been in ministry for like six years or so. I, I started fainting and I would be talking to someone. And whenever I laughed or, you know, any emotion, I would just kind of lose control of my body and come back. It was like a one second faint. And people were beginning to get very worried about that. My wife, especially. And um, I think it's, it's safe to say that most men need to be pushed to go to the doctor. And, and I was one of them. So I went to the doctors and they thought, okay, let's start with, with a battery of tests for your brain. And they spent months looking at it and came back with a conclusion, your brain is perfectly healthy. So let's start looking at your heart. And then another battery of tests and came back and said, your heart is fantastic. There is nothing wrong with your heart. Well, what are the other options? We have no other options. And th there was nothing that they could find. So meanwhile, or soon after, I went to a church uh, to do a week of prayer. And one of the members of that church was a really renowned psychiatrist. And he was one of these celebrity psychiatrists, if you will. And he said, Sam, I want to help you because I know exactly what's wrong with you. And I'm like, because I mentioned it in the sermon that I was fainting as part of a whatever sermon illustration I was trying to, to, to give. And he said, I know exactly what's happening with you. And um, let's talk. And I said, and, you know, I, I asked the pastor who that guy was. And he told me. And, and I, when he asked, I said, look, I, I really can't afford you. <laughs> and he said, it's okay. I will, let's, let's just talk. And this psychiatrist is very different from anything I expected because I expected to talk 90% of the time and then to have him kind of, you know, mention some Jedi things that I could look into. But this was the exact opposite of that. He basically talked for 90% of the time and watched my reactions. Mm -hmm. And I asked him later, why do you do it this way? Because he treated me afterwards for quite some time. And he said, well, after 40 years of practice, people lie so much. I find it much better to tell them the reality. And then I measure their reactions very carefully. And I know what's going on much faster. It saves me like six months. Uh, so, and from the first meeting, he basically said, you have great ideas about ministry. You're very creative. You want to move the church forward. 
but people are very resistant and your leaders don't understand you. Your members don't understand you. It's possible that not even your spouse understands you. And what's going on in your mind is that you've been exposed to, to such contention for so long. You're very disagreeable. So you, it's easy for you to just keep defending yourself forever. And your neurotransmitters are depleted. So I'm going to prescribe something to you and, and you're going to take it. And in two weeks, those will stop. The, the faintings will stop. And I'm like, come on. You know, it's, it's, it's too good to be true. And I, it was difficult for me to take medicine. Actually, I, I, I tell you that it was very difficult. It's, it's like, it, it was a, I failed sort of thing. Uh, yeah. And exactly as he said, two weeks later, I stopped fainting and, and nothing, it, and, and it just got better and better and better. And my life was restored. And I took those medicines for four years. He kept changing according to the other things that were happening. And I was out of it. And I had not even realized that I was depressed at the time. And it changed my life completely. Um, and it helped me to see all of this in a different light. Halfway through there, or just before that, actually, I can't remember exactly, but uh, this was in England. I was a pastor in London. One of our pastors in London committed suicide. And it was, you know, we only have like 50 pastors, 60, maybe. Yeah. So one of them, you know, going to that extent, it, it, was, it sent shockwaves throughout the whole ministry. And it was really, really powerful. And I wonder in your experience, the kind of thing that, it, that suicide does, especially if a, if a religious leader, uh, you know, takes that step, which if you think it's impossible is because you haven't hit rock bottom yet. You know, this, this is generally the, the perception. So, Paul, have you seen this? happen and and what can we do to help pastors that may contemplate suicide from time to time i have seen this um <clears throat> and i think that uh one of the we we have to look at the pipeline of uh, for ministry and the preparation of men and women who are going to go into ministry and then walk with them once they are launched um, I was watching the SpaceX launch of a rocket the other last week, and um, they didn't just set that thing on fire and let it go. They're <laughs> monitoring the telemetry of the astronauts and that thing perpetually. But uh, we have a system where you finish seminary, and if you're lucky, you get called to a church, and you get launched into that church, and um, you sink or swim. And uh, there are you know, their ministerial guidance has become vogue now. But I think that one of the things is, to help prevent that cycle is helping the aspirants understand the transition. Um, you may be, you all may be too young to remember this, but when I was growing up, there was a show on television called The Beverly Hillbillies. And um, it was a story about an Appalachian family, poor mountaineer uh, named Jed Clampett. And one day he was out shooting, hunting for some food, and he shot and hit an oil well. And that made them suddenly wealthy. And they moved from Kentucky or Tennessee or wherever they were to California with their old beat up pickup truck with Granny's rocking chair on the top to a mansion in Beverly Hills. And I looked at, remembered some of those shows and saw that they had transition difficulty that caused some depression. Young pastors have transition difficulties that set them up for trauma, drama, failure, and depression if they don't learn from it and shift quickly. Um, so I've seen young pastors who've um, fallen uh, to some of the barbs, uh, inevitable barbs of ministry, and not know how to handle them. Ideally, there's an older, more mature seasoned pastor who can help walk with them through their journeys and maybe strategize about embracing the struggles and the trials and growing from them. How do you Failing, find that that older pastor? How do you find that that pastor to help if you're young and and or not even if you're young, but someone that you can connect with that you can trust? 
I can tell you, so I can't tell you from the ministerial side, uh, but I can tell you that those things have to be built in and we have to try to build it in as soon as possible. Um, and uh, so one of the things I was talking about yesterday was accountability and just the idea that, you know, if we can just from training, right, from the time someone is a theology major, ensure that they have some type of either mentor that they're building in, you know, uh, most pastors will say that they have no close friends. That is not going to be a good, you know, uh, leadership is lonely enough. That is not going to be a good recipe for leadership, for good leadership. It's not going to be a good recipe for good health, for good mental health, right? We often talk about our health message and we have to include our mental health, right? And so um, it has to be something that's built in intentionally and as early as possible. We don't want to wait until you're this rising star and then uh, we try to build in uh, accountability and, and um, you know, friendships. And it's like, oh, is this person trying to be my friend because they see that my star is rising kind of thing, right? Um, we need to do do that as early as early as possible. Dr. D, in, in the Adventist church where, you know, we, we have most of our pastors watching from, although if you're watching from another denomination, I'm sure this will be helpful to you as well. Um, it's one of the interesting things is that it's easy for, for the leadership dynamics to change. So if you are in a conference or a union somewhere, you know, be very careful how you treat your peers because they may become your boss mm. and be very careful as a boss, how you treat your, your pastors, because in the next iteration, any of them could become your boss as you go back to a local church and so on. So this, we think, we think this is great because it provides the opportunity for God to move in whatever direction God wants to move in terms of assigning people to leadership. On the other hand, it's easy not to share what you're struggling with, with anyone because they may be in the committee that is deciding your future. So if, if they know something about you that no one else does, they may say, hmm, I'm not sure about this pastor because this, they don't even need to give a reason. I'm not sure about this pastor. I've got some reasons and I don't think that's a good idea to put him forward for this position. And suddenly what could be a leadership direction that you, that you would pursue in ministry doesn't happen because you shared something with somebody who in order to help you said, it's better not. So it's easier mm -hmm. just to say nothing. It's easier just to struggle and to, and to pretend things are okay or not to have somebody to talk to. How important is it to have somebody you trust that you can share your deepest thoughts and emotions with, even if they are dark, especially if they are dark? Yeah, it is like infinitely important. And so I will say to the person who's concerned about those leadership dynamics shifting, that you do not have to make your best friend your uh, another pastor. I understand that you have pastoral buddies who will probably have some solidarity with you. They will understand the road of being a pastor. But um, I encourage people to find people who are not necessarily in the same field as you and not necessarily doing the exact same thing. You really want to sharpen your vision by having other people, not just the same people who are looking at it from the same perspective anyhow. And so be intentional about nurturing those relationships with people who maybe are not in the pastorate, people who maybe are not, uh, you know, quote unquote ministers, even though we're all called to minister, but people who are not maybe employed by your same conference or in, in that same uh, field. Um, if I can just give a quick example of why it's so important, and um, hopefully this analogy will help kind of uh, bring this about. Uh, in 1999, uh, Payne Stewart's Learjet flew 1,400 miles off course from the flight plan for where they were supposed to be headed. But the only people who knew were the air traffic controllers. That's where they had filed their flight plan. From the ground, everything looked fine until they crashed. So before they crashed, the air traffic controllers, seeing that they were several hundred miles off course, they sent some pilots up to check on them um, because they weren't responding. All of the windows looked frosted over. The pilot, uh, the autopilot was on, um, and it's believed that everyone on board had already perished. This is just flying on autopilot. From, so from the ground, from a distance, everyone thinks everything is okay. And so I always ask pastors and uh, pastoral spouses even, uh, who are your tower people when you're dying inside, when something is going on, when you've got turmoil, when you've got loneliness, when you've got depression or secrets that you're maybe keeping and you're not sharing it with anyone, 
Who are the people who know the trajectory of your life? Who are the people who know your flight plan, right? Who, who are the people who know like so that they can check in with you? That is infinitely important because you could be dying inside and everyone will clap and they will applaud because it seems like you're doing a great job as a pastor. Oh, they preached a good sermon and oh, they brought people to Christ, right? And here you are dying inside and on autopilot and nobody knows until you crash and burn. And I'm sure that's the case every time we hear about a suicide. It's like, wow, I didn't know. Nobody knew. No one was aware of what this person was struggling with. And for pastors who already are in a very lonely position, they have to be intentional about building that in. It's just a requirement. It's just like you have to be intentional about having your daily devotion time. You have to be intentional about praying, right? You have to be intentional about nurturing relationships. We are all relational beings and pastors are not exempt from that somehow. Excuse me. Is this the equivalent of wearing perhaps PPE if you work in a hospital? You know, there are certain things that you need to do to protect yourself. Is it, Could we have this analogy or is this going too far? Uh, no, I don't think it's going too far at all. So we know what the protocols are with uh, COVID-19, right? We know what the protocols are if you're going into a room where someone has tuberculosis. We know what the protocols are. We need to have some protocols in place for leadership. Same thing. We need to have some protocols in place to where it is expected. Once again, I, I think it's, it should be expected that pastors take some type of sabbatical on a regular basis. One of my favorite authors, Dan Allender, said the number one, he's done decades of pastoral care. He said the number one indicator of longevity in ministry is rest, period. The number one wow. thing that will let me know whether or not you are going to make it from here to being retired as a pastor is whether or not you take rest seriously, whether or not you actually take time away and replenish. If you are not replenishing, what are you pouring from? Mm. That's how you burn out. Pouring from an empty cup, pouring from an empty cup, pouring from an empty cup. Imagine having a tea kettle on and there's no liquid in it. You just have it on the burner. So here you are on fire, but there's nothing inside. Right? Well, it will burn everything, won't it? It'll burn everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If there's somebody listening now, Dr. D, who has a pastor, whose pastor is, they think that maybe they're struggling, even though they're not sure. And they send this link to the pastor and then their pastor is watching this now. What would you say directly to the pastor is the number one thing they should focus on? Uh, what's the next step toward... Um, better health, mental health for them. Yeah, so self-evaluation is very important. Um, but uh, there's something that Andy Stanley says, and I love what he said. He said, it's not just your experience that counts. It's evaluated experience. What The point is, you need someone else on the outside of you to really give you some feedback on what's going on. I love the Bible text now. I like, I didn't like it when I was younger, but I love that Bible text that tells us the heart is deceptive, right? It's deceitful above all else. Who can know it? That means even you don't know what's going on with you. Who can know mm -hmm. it? I, we can't even tell when we're deceiving ourselves. We can't tell when we have something blinding our eyes and we're walking off a cliff, right? And so we have to have someone on the outside of us. So I would say, first of all, start doing some self, uh, some self introspection. Schedule an appointment with a therapist. There is no shame in doing that. I'm, I, I say that from uh, both sides of the couch, by the way. I am a very biased therapist because I have had wonderful therapy, and I don't think that I would be equipped to do what I do on a daily basis, wading through other people's trauma, I would not be equipped to do that if I did not have good therapy. And if I did not do checks on a routine basis, that's not just, oh, I had good therapy a long time ago. No, no, no. I do routine checks. In fact, when I decided that I was going to focus mostly on trauma recovery, I immediately made an appointment with a therapist immediately. Was I, I wasn't even experiencing any symptoms necessarily at that time. I just knew that I needed to have some protocols in place, just like the PPE, right? Um, and if you are wading through people's trauma, there is something called vicarious trauma. And if you are being, uh, you know, you're constantly wading through other people's trauma, it's going to impact you. Yeah. What is around you will impact you. And so the next step would be to evaluate yourself and have someone else evaluate you as well. Let's dig deeper into this vicarious trauma sort of thing. Yeah. I, I, it's the first time that I'm hearing about it and I want to understand it more. Um, it, it, from what I understood so far from what you said is I'm ex I am exposed to trauma here. If you're a good pastor, you're going to experience compassion for the people that you are, that you are next to, that you are um, ministering to. And that means you will 
it, it you will absorb their trauma is that what it means or it's possible that yeah tell us more well, if you're good at em empathy, it means you will experience their trauma to some degree. So empathy is a feeling with. Um, when you think about sympathy, sympathy is like a feeling for. Um, it's kind of, oh, poor you, right? Um, imagine being on the outside of a cave. Someone is stuck in a cave. They're in a dark place. And you're kind of yelling into them, oh, I'm so sorry that you're down in there. Uh, I, I, I know that it must be really dark. Um, uh, that's sympathy. Empathy is climbing into the cave this is the way out climbing into the cave mm. whoa it's dark in here um yeah like experiencing with someone right and so if you're experiencing with someone if you're good at empathy which you really need to be good at empathy if you're going to be a good pastor you really need to be good at empathy right um if you're experiencing with then you will experience some of that trauma as well and so we have these things in our uh, brains called mirror neurons mirror neurons and neurons are simply brain nerve cells right so uh mirror neurons do not simply light up when you're doing something that's what the brain nerve cells do if i'm hammering a nail my there's parts of my brain that will light up on the motor strip because there's movement going on there are parts of my brain that will light up uh uh on the imagery scale because i'm looking at something right there are just parts of my brain that will light up like when when i say light up i'm talking about like on mris when we're looking at a functional right? mri yes activity mm -hmm. in the brain that's just, uh like where we know that neurons are firing things are happening uh that's for me hammering a nail what we have found with what we call mirror neurons is that those same places of the brain will light up when i'm watching someone else hammering the nail huh. so i'm not even doing it myself i'm simply watching it observing it sitting down in my home, observing it, and those parts of my brain will light up so that literally by beholding, something is happening in my brain as well. Wow. And so that's where it becomes important to recognize you are feeling with this person, you are experiencing with this person. So when I'm walking you through uh, you losing your loved one and I'm in the room with them and saying prayers over them as they're passing away, I'm experiencing death, I'm watching them dying. Sure. And so I'm experiencing it along with you. So now I've gone from that home to now to the person who was, uh, you know, uh, possibly is telling me about their sexual assault and the person who's telling me about their divorce. I'm I'm carrying all of these experiences and my brain is just lighting up as if I'm experiencing all of this trauma myself as well. The only way that we can actually carry all of those things is by carrying it with others. If we try to do it on our own, that's where we usually see a downfall. That's where we usually see, and that's not to blame the pastors at all. That is not to blame them at all. It's simply to say, it's not the load that you're carrying. It's the way that you're carrying it, trying to carry it on your own. Yeah. Wow. That's even as you described the the scenarios there i i i could sense my body reacting to that as i yeah. remember being in those situations mm -hmm. and and you vividly remember it as if it's your own family mm -hmm. um and but that's the, the temptation is not to do that the temptation for a pastor is to visit someone who just lost somebody to read a couple of passages and leave because mm -hmm. then you don't need to allow that vulnerability of really feeling with, and as you described, entering the cave. It is not nice to enter caves, you know, and especially because of the, of the, you, you could visit somebody who lost somebody in the same afternoon, you visit the hospital where somebody just had a baby and they asked you to go in and pray for the, for the child. So a glorious, happy situation four hours after a terrible situation. And that's the ministry of Jesus too. He was invited mm -hmm. to parties and he met the, the most um, devastating illnesses and so on that people had. The Los Angeles Times um, has an article about uh, Wilson, who was a pastor. And here is his last tweet. Okay. I'm going to read the article. Loving Jesus doesn't always cure suicidal thoughts, Wilson wrote. Loving Jesus doesn't always cure depression. Loving Jesus doesn't always cure PTSD. Loving Jesus doesn't always cure anxiety. But that doesn't mean Jesus doesn't offer us companionship and comfort. He always does that. That night, Wilson, 30, killed himself, according to Harvest Christian Fellowship, where he was an associate pastor. How do we make sense of something so traumatic as that? You know, he was an associate pastor. His senior pastor will never be the same after that, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. You know, his family, the the church and etc. You know, what could 
they have done. You mentioned people that know that know you, that understand that you are not well, even though everyone else everyone else thinks that you are well. Uh, Paul, welcome back. Thank you for joining us again. You had some internet trouble, I understand. Oh yeah. Well, I had to wind up getting another computer, but technology works. Well, that was a quick turnaround. Uh, by getting another computer, I don't mean I don't think you went to buy another computer. Right? You just picked up another one from the house. Oh. That would have been quick. We're talking here about this Los Angeles Times article that mentions a pastor that wrote his last tweet was uh, ended with, um, but that doesn't mean Jesus doesn't offer us companionship and comfort. He always does that. So you can clearly see that he loves Jesus, but you know, the darkness took over in a way. And, and at 30 years old, he killed himself. Um, he was a pastor, associate pastor of Harvest Christian Fellowship. Not sure which denomination, if any, that is. And it's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. um, what, what could the church have done, if anything? What, what could we do so that this story becomes a, a true exception, not something that happens normally? Uh, that's a good question, uh, because we are so good at hiding. And like you said, the counselor said to you, uh, lying. And uh, we lie to ourselves, we lie to others. And so it's hard for someone else to know the interiority of another person um, if they're not being open, uh, transparent, and vulnerable at times. And that's tough when you're climbing because you don't want people to see your um, imperfections, even though they do. Um, but I think we need to build a culture of compatibility, accountability, and, um, and safety, security. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, Dr. D., what are your final thoughts for us today about all the things that we've been talking about? What would you like to leave our viewers with? Yes. And so it kind of hits on something that you're asking, which is what could people have done? What can people do ahead of time? Um, and so uh, what we're saying is helping others share the load, building relationships uh, is what really counts, is what really matters. Uh, empathizing with people is so important, right? Being able to feel with. I always think about Job's friends and how they kind of, in my opinion, get a bad rap. Um, people always talk about Job's bad friends, right? Uh, uh, but you know when they became bad friends, when they started opening their mouths, <laughs> when they started doing all that talking, that's right, uh, doing all that talking. Um, but before that, when Job first found out about what happened with his family, uh, Job's friends came and they sat on the ground with him and wept for seven days. Most of us cannot sit for silence with others for seven minutes. Most of us can't sit for seven seconds. Seven seconds of silence is a long time, right? And so if we can provide some silence, some therapeutic silence is what we call it in my field. If we can provide that space where people can just be themselves, be accepted for the pain that they are going through, be accepted for the trauma that they are going through, be accepted for everything that they're experiencing, that will be a great help. But we also have to do that in light of the fact that we cannot prevent other people's behaviors. We can't stop someone else from harming themselves. We can't stop someone else or force someone else into therapy. I've had people before say, like, should I have the therapist call my husband? And, no, you have to <laughs> allow your husband to reach out and call a therapist, right? We're not going to call them to give them therapy. And people have to be willing to um, recognize that you can't control someone else's behavior. And so for people who are feeling guilty because um, whether it's someone left the pastorate or someone uh, uh, did die by suicide, whatever it might be, you can't control someone else's behaviors, but you can try to create a safe space space for people to thrive. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, there is a, a Jewish concept of sitting Shiva, mm -hmm. which is just going and sitting and just when the, somebody loses a loved one, a loved one, and you just sit and that's all you do. You just sit yeah. and then you eat because eating is good, even in those situations or especially, and, and you don't say anything. Um, and this is one of the fears that people have, you know, so-and-so just went through this trauma, whatever that may be. Uh, I don't know what to say, so I will avoid them. Um, and that's something that lots of people experience. You really don't need to say anything. You you just need to go and 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 be with and 
um, and it's it's harder to sit in silence than it is to speak. I I see that very much. But the families that I'm still in contact with are the families that I just sat and mm -hmm. cried with them and didn't really say anything because there was nothing to say. You know, what do you say when there is an accident and an 18-year-old dies? Mm -hmm. Or the 37-year-old the who was about to get married uh, um, gets cancer, postpones the wedding, and then dies. You know, th there's nothing to say. Apart yeah. from the hope of the resurrection, which they already believe in, and it's something that you should read, and, and at some point, probably before you go, you should leave them with that message. But there is a time of just suffering with, and that generally means a lot to people that are going through it. I remember when my father died, the pastor who came didn't know him. And my sister and I still joke about it to this day. And what the pastor said is what they would have expected my father to be like. But he really wasn't anything like what the guy was describing, the pastor was describing. And so my sister and I laughed to this day that the comments that the pastor made were like 90% off target. And we just listened and, and so on. So it became a remarkable moment for all the wrong reasons. And sometimes the pastors too just need to to receive that comfort of yeah. others that are feeling with them and just sitting in silence and and are just on their side if you will uh paul what are your final thoughts and i wonder if you could pray for us after that i'd be honored um there's so much to be said about this topic um i think that it's important that leaders of pastors uh, become informed um, about their own experiences and about how to mentor those who are going through crisis. Um, cracking the whip is no longer a valid motivational professional tool or a tool to motivate professionals. Um, I think that as Dr. D mentioned, empathy and safety, creating safe spaces, and uh, creating avenues for coaching and personal development support for uh, the pastors as they transition. And it's not just the young ones, because the senior ones, the ones who have been around for a while, as I have been now, who have been through so much and may have had uh, incredible successes, now begin to reach points where you're not as energetic and your preaching style is not as effective as it was 25 or 30 years ago. Like David on the battlefield, he began to lose a step and was almost killed by a giant. It was then that his own people said, you, you can't go back to battle with us anymore, lest we lose our national icon. <clears throat> it was then that David found his deepest moment and his most pivotal failure in life. So it's not just the young ones, it's the senior ones. And uh, the national statistics on suicide suggest that um, it is a greater problem among those who are older, really, than it is among the youngers in our profession. Hmm. Um, I would say that we should look at uh, young pastors and older pastors, the story of Saul and um, his rapid fall from grace, and the story of David and his redemption in, in the aftermath of his perfidy believing that God is the God of second chances, the God of restoration, and a God who understands our humanity. And I would urge us all to seek the support of mature counselors, spiritual leaders, who can uh, journey with us and help us through some of our struggles and not to diminish our spiritual connection, but build upon it with a, an interleaving of spirituality and behavioral health guidance. Thank you. Would you pray for us, please, and for those that are listening, and perhaps even those that are struggling through this at this moment? 
Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for this medium that has taken this hour to dialogue about and offer dynamics of support to pastors and spiritual leaders who are struggling with depression, um, despair, um, and maybe even suicidal thoughts. Lord, I pray that in this moment, you would reinstall a glimmer or a beam of hope and purpose into the lives of those who are hearing. And if there are any who are battling the scourge of depression and suicide, that you would bind that in the name of Jesus and guide them to someone like Dr. D and my daughter, Dr. D, and others who have a spiritual perspective and can help us recover from some of our moral injuries and some of our own failings. I thank you for Sam. I thank you for Dr. D. And ask that you would continue to guide them, guide us, direct us into paths where we can be of service and help others to your name's honor and glory. Deliver us from evil, I pray, and use us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you both for joining us at ANN in depth. Uh, this is your second time, Dr. D. We hope to have you in all of these topics that are so important. Uh, thank you for watching ANN in depth. We hope that you will subscribe to this channel and click the little bell so you can get every week the great notifications for new programs. And they, they, their subjects vary tremendously. Uh, for now, from us, thank you. We'll see you next week.